good evening everyone so today is the last session of our pediatric immunology series that is uh, we have a uh, uh, five series done so far excellently coordinated by dr geeta so this is the last one in the series and uh, it's a privilege to have dr marco getono for giving uh, who's an expert in systemic auto inflammatory diseases for giving us an update on this uh, cryopyranopathies so firstly i would like to uh, welcome dr marco getorno uh, for the pediatric immunology seminars uh, we have dr ajit kumar uh, sir is the professor and head of department of pediatrics uh, welcome sir we have uh, dr vinod karia uh, sir is the uh, director in igib i also welcome sir and uh, Uh, we have dr geeta who is running the uh, pediatric immunology department in government medical college kodikot uh, welcome ma'am and uh, we have a uh, lot of senior faculty senior senior professors of calicut medical college sashidan sir and uh, our iap person mohan das sir who will be joining soon i welcome everyone and i hand over to dr ajit kumar sir for uh, for his uh, presentation address thank you ajay and uh, uh, good evening everyone and good evening my teachers and dear friends it's a uh, last of the series on or on uh, auto inflammatory syndromes and primary immunodeficiencies and uh, it was really a uh, uh, interesting series for all of us and also uh, uh, what you call we gained lot of knowledge in this during this period and also got to know lot of scientists uh, who were working in this field so on behalf of uh, department of pediatrics and uh, and indian academy pediatrics uh, indian academy pediatrics calicut branch and csr igb guardian uh, consortium and fpid i am really uh, I mean, take this opportunity to welcome our dear speaker uh, dr marco gatorno and who is from the gasellini institute and uh, of italy one of the premier institutes and uh, in italy and uh, i also welcome all our teachers here Uh, uh, dear teachers, uh, as well as all the delegates who are attending from far, from all over the world, and uh, also welcome our faculty in the department, as well as senior pediatricians to this. I also welcome all the IAP uh, office bearers, the academic pediatrics office bearers. And here, as you all know, NLP three uh, is a, a, a spectrum of autoinflammatory syndromes. It's very rare, and uh, we have uh, caps. muckel wells no bit so these are very rare syndromes which are which uh, if we identify have a good uh, treatment response and which may present even from the newborn period itself so very important to identify them and uh, even though they are very rare uh, the caps the muckel wells as the no bit and so i i think we have the best speaker uh, for this uh, and uh, and i invite dr krishnan to introduce the speaker Krishna. Okay, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker in front of you. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Dr. Marco Gattarno, who is basically a researcher with a keen interest in the field of autoinflammatory diseases. Dr. Marco Gattarno is the head of the unit for. auto inflammatory diseases and immunodeficiencies at Giannina Gasolini Institute in Genova Italy he is the uh, president of international society of uh, systemic auto inflammatory diseases he has a high h index with more than 250 publications in international journals and uh, more than uh, 16000 citations he is the editor of a reference book on familial mediterranean fever dr marco gatorno currently is the principal investigator of many research projects among these uh, e fever and the euro fever are the main uh, research projects going on with this brief words on our speaker Dr. Gatarno, I hand over the mic to uh, our IAP President, Dr. Mohan Das, for continuing the uh, session. Thank you all. 
you all uh, i'm very very happy uh, unfortunately i would love to come to visit you as soon as possible when this nightmare of the pandemic will end this is my town genoa and my hospital is on the seaside if you want to come to 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 to, to, to find me uh, you'll be of course more than welcome um today i was i am asked to to talk about a, a very very favorite uh, topic to me that the, the cryoperinopathies. Now we should say an RP3 mediated auto-inflammatory disease with the new nomenclature. Um, uh, I hope that... Uh, okay. Uh, for us as pediatricians, the story starts from uh, 1981 <clears throat> because uh, uh, when uh, Anne-Marie Prieur in uh, Nekea described for the first, patient, uh, first time patient <clears throat> with a permanent skin rash since birth with fever, arthritis, uh, a, 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 a abnormal epiphyseal appearance, neurologic involvement with mental retardation and chronic meningitis. And she called this uh, disease as a, a, a CHINCA, chronic infantile neurological cutaneous articular syndrome. This is the starting point uh, from uh, a pediatrician uh, related to uh, this condition, but uh, uh, 20 years before, uh, two dermatologists, Mackel and Wells, uh, identify a new condition, genetic condition, clearly autosomical dominant, in which the patient have urticarial stiffness and amyloidosis, and uh, that is what is now known as Mackel Wells diseases. Um, um, Another important aspect that came 20 years, and that is the typical feature of Markle-Well syndrome with urticarial rash, hearing loss, arthritis, and uh, a possible development of amyloidosis. But 20 years before, in 1940, we have the first identification of patients with uh, the so-called familiar urticarial, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, familiar cold urticaria, in which the patient have recurrent episode of fever with urticarial rash, conjunctivitis, arthritis after cold exposure. So again, in an autosomical dominant fashion. Uh, this helped uh, our uh, friend Al Hoffman in 2020 to identify in some cases, uh, with uh, a, a, a story of Michael Wells, a family history of Michael Wells or FCAS, uh, the, the, the gene, using the classical approach uh, at that time uh, uh, of gene hunting, uh, that uh, came out for the identification of the gene that uh, was called at the beginning CHAS1, called Induced Auto Inflammatory Syndrome 1, but is now known as NLRP3. Um, uh, we, have, we are in depth with this man that unfortunately is left away uh, some years ago. Uh, Jurg Chop is a, a, Swiss, a Swiss biochemistry that uh, uh, in uh, the beginning of the 2000 uh, day, uh, he was able to identify the role of uh, NLRP3 uh, in the formation of the so-called inflammasome and the activation of uh, IL-1. Uh, as you know, before the identification of the inflammasome, what we know, knew is that I1 is uh, produced as a pro-cytokine uh, after stimulation of, uh, for example, uh, toli receptors. Uh, there is a huge amount of pro-I1. You can see here uh, this huge amount of the protein uh, that have to be cleaved by an enzyme that is called caspase 1. Uh, thanks to the, the knowledge of uh, the NLRP3 and the, his, uh, uh, let's say, binding with other proteins such as ASK, you, we, we, are able to, we were able to identify, Jurgen Chop was identify this system that is called inflammasome that is able to activate the caspase 1 for the cleavage of IL-1 
and the secretion into circulation. This is uh, now uh, known like NLRP3 inflammasome. Of course, there are other mechanisms that can control the activation of the inflammasome, ATP, uh, reactive oxygen species, and different uh, uh, signals that are able to activate the system in a very potent way. Um, we also interact with Charles Dinarello, that uh, was the founder, uh, the, the, the person that in the 1970 uh, was able to class to identify this uh, cytokine, the first cytokine, uh, that, as you know, has many potent uh, 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 inflammatory phenotypes. As you know, people, the, the patient with uh, NRP3, have a gain of function mutation that lead this patient very active in the overactivation of uh, IL-1 and over secretion of IL-1 upon very little stimuli. Uh, that means uh, that this patient produces huge amount of cytokines. That leads to a, a very severe phenotype in patients with uh, uh, the most severe phenotype that uh, has been observed by Anne-Marie uh, Prieur in Necker uh, with a very early onset, you can see here, uh, with the skin rash that is rather typical, is very difficult, is urticarial, but is very difficult from uh, different from a, a classical uh, urticaria because uh, is uh, is mainly related is not uh, itching, uh, is not related to angioedema, uh, it, they it not respond to antihistaminics, uh, and of course it can vary during the times. So, for example, you can have it in the arms in the morning. Uh, maybe it could disappear and appear in the trunk, so it can vary during the time, but not as quickly as in the normal uh, urticaria. And what, most importantly, if we make the biopsy with, uh, uh, in this condition, we cannot find any sign of urticaria. We, find a, we found a very important perivascular infiltrate with a lot of neutrophils, no sign of uh, vasculitis, not uh, uh, necros, uh, fibrotic necrosis, and so on. Uh, this is rather typical for a uh, neutrophilic dermatosis. Uh, so these patients have this orticarial rash with inflammation that is very, is very uh, relevant and that have to, uh, let's say, make us as aware on the possibility of this condition. Another important task for the most important uh, um, um, the most uh, severe uh, manifestation that is SINCA is this uh, skull abnormalities. You can see some of our patients uh, with different mutation, and they really seem to be uh, the same with this frontal bossing. Uh, this adolescent was able to hide with the, with the hair, but this is rather consistent in many of the patients. Other possible uh, um, involvement is the bone involvement. They can have an overgrowth, on, on, for example, patella or other bones, you can see here these signs that is not related to a, a, a pulmonary involvement in a patient with a mosaicism, and again, uh, also at the level of the thumb. This is rather consistent with the more severe phenotype, Sinca phenotype. And uh, there was some, some doctor, some colleague that uh, were able to identify and to study, and they find that uh, there is in this patient an endochondral ossification with an uh, alteration of the chondrocyte. Uh, this is rather characteristic, and LRP3 is expressed mainly in monocytes uh, uh, and the myeloid lineage, but also expressed in chondrocyte. We still don't know which is the, 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 the function of an LRP3. And what is, uh, uh, is possible to see in some patients is the possibility to develop chondroma, uh, and in some unfortunate cases, also even chondrosarcoma. Dr. Ajay? Uh, Dr. Marco, uh, are you there? I think we have lost. Yeah, yeah, I think so. That's it. 
Ajay. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Sorry. Sir. Uh, is it okay? Uh, yeah. Can you start yeah, sharing yes. me once more? Okay. Uh, did you did I interrupt here in this slide or before? Just before. Just before. Yeah. Before. Yeah. When? Can you? Uh, Hello. The, your your. Can you uh, start sharing your screen? It's, it's yes. But when when uh, until what did you were you able to 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 listen up, up to the slide up to the slide on contrasarcoma contrasarcoma yeah ah, contrasarcoma very good uh, sir sir you have to stop screen now and do it again okay I screen I I share the screen again can you see uh, yes sir okay. Very good. I, I, I start again. I, I continue. So what I was saying that besides this, many of these patients have a growth delay uh, related to the genetic diagnosis, but also the, the persistent inflammation. I was just showing to you the difference in these two twins, Dizagotis twins. You can see here the patient, this patient on the right, the mutation and the, the twin sister that is completely healthy, the difference. Uh, the neurological involvement in the more severe part, the, the SINCA, is so relevant as uh, in the first uh, presentation, these patients have a chronic meningi meningitis with headache. Uh, they can have early morning vomiting. Uh, there is uh, the classical leptin meningitis, increased intracranial pressure. And of course, one possible uh, complication is brain atrophy and arachnoid additions that can lead, of course, to a severe damage uh, with uh, uh, mental retardation. Uh, before the, 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 the initiation of a proper uh, treatment of this patient, uh, most of them had a very, very important uh, uh, mental retardation. That is uh, very, very important. Yeah. That's why it's so is important to recognize early this condition because mm -hmm. we have to make a very early diagnosis and very early treatment to try to prevent the neurological manifestation and the progression of uh, the brain damage and mental retardation. I will show you an example. Uh, also, hearing loss, as you know, in CAPS is very important. Uh, this patient can develop very early. You can see one of our patients, uh, hearing loss, severe hearing loss uh, that can be uh, mild or moderate, but in some patient very severe. 60% uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, in, in our Italian population were affected by this kind of diseases, uh, this kind of complication. And this is related to <clears throat> a uh, announcement contrast, uh, uh, announcement of, uh, 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 inflammation of uh, uh, the cochlea uh, that has, can be uh, observed with a specific, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, um, the, the specific uh, uh, magnetic resonance images uh, to be detected. It's very important to, to, to study. Um, Michael Wells uh, also can have a hearing loss, uh, but we will talk about later on. A manifestation, they can have conjunctivitis, uveitis, uh, the corneal infiltrates, and what is quite important is papilledema. It's very important to follow this patient uh, for uh, <clears throat> the ocular examination, eye examination. This is a papilledema of a patient with uh, this uh, variant. Uh, of course, they can have some very important complication like uh, uh, corneal clouding, retinal scaring, and very, very important optic nerve atrophy that can lead to blindness. That is another reason why you have really to follow very, very closely the patient and also to try to recognize very early the disease because otherwise the complication could be permanent before any treatment. Uh, we use a lot of optical coherence tomography, OCT, to, to follow this patient. You can see here how uh, it can be really, really, really uh, useful to make, uh, to uh, understand the papilledema that you can see here in this patient, and also a reduction of optic nerve thickness uh, in this other patient. So it's a, it's a, a, a <clears throat> uh, examination that we perform 
every uh, every every six months. Uh, uh, what is quite interesting that of course you can have you have seen the most severe phenotype and you have to be very careful in recognize this phenotype with the earlier early onset uh, urticaria rash and inflammation and with this severe neurological involvement. But however, you have to understand that you can understand, you can follow also patients like Nicolò that uh, came to, he was born in 2013. He had from the first week of life sporadic urticaria rash. After two weeks, a daily urticaria rash with no fever, no fever, normal mental neurological development. It's very, very, very beautiful, very tiny uh, uh, little kid, uh, no dysmorphism at all. Uh, at the age of nine months, uh, nine months he, he went to a, an allergist evaluation. Uh, he had some examination, uh, even antinuclear antibodies and complement that were normal and negative. But as usual, the allergologist uh, sometimes forget the existence of acute phase reactant. They, they, they didn't check for ECR or CRP, and indeed they were elevated. That would be something that could be alert this patient. And so in the first visit in our hospital, it was a normal neurological development. It was a very tiny boy with this skin rash, no facial dysmorphism, no neurological impairment. He had just a mild skin rash. CRP was elevated. Of course, the diagnosis was very suspected with a milder form, much milder rather than in sync. Uh, but what was quite interesting in this patient was to talk with the family. And indeed, we discovered that the father that at that time was uh, 34 years old, at the age of two, started to have an urticaria rash with fever, arthralgia, arthritis, conjunctivitis. At the age of 25, he detected a severe, a severe bilateral hearing loss, late onset hearing loss. Then, finally, at the age of 29, a diagnosis of steel disease was pointed out. Uh, and though, Finally, a treatment of anti one blockers was started with a complete control of the clinical laboratory manifestation. She was cured. And so they were so happy. And uh, of course, that was cured like steel disease with anti one blockers. So what the, the sad part of the story that <coughs> this man waited for several times before having a child because he was worrying to, to have a genetic disease. And all adult rheumatologists say, no, no, no problem. Still, disease is not a genetic disease. Go ahead, no problem. And it was very hard to tell them that uh, indeed it was maybe affected by a, a, a genetic disease. And indeed, that was the case in the father and the son that were carrier of this variant <coughs> that is linked with a, a, a less severe form of uh, creopidinity, that is, Mackenwell syndrome, in which, as you understood, the phenotype is much, much less severe. And in contrast with the Sinca, in which is, that is so severe that you usually have a de novo mutation, so you do not have other members in the family, in this condition, <coughs> milder, you have, of course, the classical autosomical dominant uh, 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 penetrance. Of course, the quality of life in Sinca patient is very, very bad. You can see here the difference of a normal individual and uh, in red, uh, the Sinca patient, many, 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 many aspects of the quality of life are really, really uh, bad. Um, and you have, of course, an intermediate uh, uh, alteration of quality of life in patients with a milder for Markle Wells. Uh, but you can also meet uh, patients like Emma. This is quite recent. Emma, <clears throat> uh, six months had, uh, again, urticaria rash have a limb uh, with increased CRP, antinuclear antibodies, and a good response to steroid, some fever at a certain point. The inter interesting thing is that uh, also the father had urticaria lash arthritis his childhood with keratoveitis, and uh, it was labeled as a seronegative arthritis and was treated without success with methotrexate and steroid. Also, the grandmother had the same presentation with no keratoveitis, but uh, it was more labeled because of the urticaria rash and the elevation of good phase reactant as a, a lupus-like phenotype. And she, she was treated with hydroxychloroquine with, with, that, with no response. The, 
important things of this patient, and that was also the same for Emma, that both have a very mild form that was mainly observed during the winter season and after cold exposure. So usually they went quite well, but uh, when they were exposed to the cold, of course, they have these bouts of the disease. Uh, the same clinical picture, very interesting, was also observed in the two other generation. So this is the first family in Italy, the big family in Italy that we have with a, a classical uh, uh, familiar cold auto-inflammatory syndrome, in which the syndrome are mainly related to exposure to cold. It's the milder form of the cryoperinitis. Do you understand? They, these conditions are three different, three conditions that are uh, uh, related to the same spectrum, the same a similar uh, um, variant, uh, different variant of the same gene that can give rise to a different severity from familiar cold anti-inflammatory disease uh, uh, to the more severe sink. Uh, thanks to the Eurofever registry, we were able to, to study a lot, uh, many, many patients. This is a patient uh, study some years ago. Uh, also, <clears throat> we, we try for the first time to have a sort of genotype-phenotype correlation. And, uh, and you can find uh, indeed the possibility if you have a patient, for example, for with this mutation, you can have, <clears throat> let's say, much uh, 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 less uh, probability to have a positive family history uh, or not to have a neurological involvement. Or, for example, if you have this kind of mutation, you have a, a lot of pro probability to have a chronic course and, for example, hearing loss. You can see here. So, uh, adding the number of patients, you, we can also understand uh, more on the possibility of the different genotype to give uh, different uh, uh, phenotypes. One important point that uh, is uh, pertinent to this condition is that a relevant number of patients that are clinically uh, diagnosed as SINCA or NOMID show uh, no heterozygous germline mutation for neural PT especially when the Sanger method was uh, observed, was uh, rather uh, possible that this patient with a clear-cut Sinca phenotype uh, turned out to be negative. We have to say that most of these patients have a somatic mosaicism uh, that was uh, identified more than 70% of these negative patients. Uh, you can see some, just some somatic, uh, uh, some cells are carrying of uh, this condition with a level of mosaicism that could be very low uh, from 4 to 35, but some patients can have a clear cut <coughs> and very severe phenotype, even with a very low percentage of cells uh, uh, leading uh, with the, uh, uh, the gene. Um, this uh, uh, possibility is also less frequently in patients with macular patient. In our Italian population, we have a 30% of our patient that was a mix between CAPS and uh, uh, macular wells in which we found patient with a mosaicism. Um, we also uh, have to know and also to tell to our friends, uh, adult rheumatologists, that sometimes we can meet patient with a late onset uh, uh, CAPS phenotype, you can see this patient at the age of 54, start to have the classical phenotype of macular wells just at the age of 54. We are used to think about these diseases in the very early onset, but uh, some somatic mosaicins can present with a late onset. Um, so some help for the diagnosis and classification of this uh, condition. So if we go to the, uh, to the literature, uh, some, some two years ago, uh, last year, we, we published this effort uh, in the context of the Eurofever registry and uh, in which we, we try to set up uh, the new classification criteria for auto-inflammatory recurrent fever. That was a huge, uh, 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 let's say, um, uh, effort because we took three years uh, evaluation, evaluating through patient making a analysis, statistical analysis uh, with the help of the expert and then make a, a, consens a, con a consensus among the expert uh, to build up this evidence-based uh, criteria 
for the classification of the recurrent fever uh, that for the first time <clears throat> are linked together the presence of genetics with the presence of the clinic. So uh, for the first time, you have the possibility to, to, to recognize patients that have a confirmed enough NLRP3 genotype with vertical rash, red eye, and neurosensory renal loss. Even to label if the patient have no, not confirmatory uh, variant or no significance, if they have at least two of these uh, conditions in the presence of inflammation. This uh, criteria have a very high sensitivity and specificity, as you can see here. Okay, uh, another important tool that you can uh, use, uh, if you have the possibility, of course, to make the genetic test, is uh, this uh, uh, classification. We did this kind of effort for the classification criteria, thanks to a grant of the European Union with a ERA project. In the same grant, there is also a part related to the gen geneticist. <clears throat> they were able to uh, make this effort to the classification of all the variants of the main autoinflammatory disease that are included in the InFever uh, uh, website. You know that the InFever website is a, a very important website in, to, in which you can find all the variant that has been described for the different and the main autoinflammatory diseases. And with thanks to this project, uh, we were able to uh, provide a classification to each variant that is included in the registry. And you can see here, uh, you can, if you have a patient with this variant, you can go to the, to the website and to see uh, if this uh, variant is considered the pathogenetic or likely pathogenetic or benign, or uh, uncertain significance. This is rather a good tool that you can use in your daily practice. That is brand new. Another tool, if you go to the Eurofever uh, uh, website, what we did uh, with, uh, not me, but <laughs> my, my resident did an incredible job to screen all the patients that were uh, included in the registry and uh, to uh, describe uh, all the phenotype uh, associated to the phenotype, to the genotype. So, for example, for this variant, uh, uh, this our our um, residents were able to uh, say how many patients we have in the registry, uh, which was the age of onset, uh, how many we have a continuous or recurrent disease course, and the main clinical manifestation, uh, the less the less common manifestation, particularly the response to treatment, and also some particular complication. Again, if you found the patient with a mutation, you can go to the website and just to see what happened to the other uh, patient with this variant. Uh, how to treat a patient with hyperin associated periodic syndrome? Uh, you know that the strategy uh, was related to what we usually do in uh, our immune system. As you know, we are able to provide uh, a sort of uh, uh, moderator that is I1 receptor antagonist that is able to compete with the receptor at the level of receptor. So it's able to, to compete and bind just on the subunit of the receptor. And this is very important because it's block the receptor. I1 beta is not more able, and also I1 alpha are not able anymore to, 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 to uh, make a, a a binding with the, pro, the, the, the wall, uh, let's say, um, receptor, and this not, do not transmit the, the signal because just one part of the receptor is, uh, is uh, uh, included. So thanks to this, uh, as you know, uh, a recombinant I1 receptor antagonist was uh, 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 provided, and uh, that was uh, done mainly for a rheumatoid arthritis and was a failure for rheumatoid arthritis, I have to say, but we were very lucky because as soon as we understood the genetic cause of uh, CAPS and also the pathogenic mechanism, thanks to the Jurgen Chop and the inflammasome, this is a fantastic example of translational medicine. So we understood that there was a treatment already available in the market and our colleague in London, uh, Phil Hawkins uh, and Lachman start to treat the first patient with uh, I1 receptor antagonist Anakindra. That was our first patient, that is a mosaicist, I have to say, 
that have a Sinca phenotype since the first day of his life. He has urticaria rash, uh, a headache, and uh, other stuff. And fortunately, after the, <clears throat> the first injection, everything went away. You can see here, there was completely switch off. It, it, was, it was 33 years old at that time. And of course, his life changed completely. This is the treatment of choice. Of course, we have in, uh, in av the availability of other I1 blockers, especially in, in Europe and the United States, in other countries. I'm, I'm afraid not in, in India. Maybe we can discuss. We have also the monoclonal antibodies, canakinumab. I'm not sure that you have an akinra, and maybe we have, this, we have to discuss. Of course, this leads to an incredible <clears throat> amelioration. You can see here before treatment, the quality of life, and what happens after treatment. Uh, most of the patients have a complete amelioration, sometimes a sort of a normalization of uh, the quality of life. Um, these are the possible treatment. So there are, again, some open questions on treatment in terms of long-term efficacy. Uh, what to do in very young children, and so on. Uh, even because when we have some data from the Eurofever Registry, this is some years ago, uh, many years ago, in 2013, what was quite interesting that <clears throat> uh, there was still some patient, and a relevant number of patients that, of course, have a complete efficacy of anakinra or kalakibona, but there are still some patients that have a partial response. This is rather important. So sometimes, some patients have still some uh, elevation acute phase reactance, still some clinical manifestation. Uh, this is a problem, especially for the problem of uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, some clinical aspect. Uh, it's clear that uh, the treatment is usually is able to control, completely control in most of the patients, the clinical and laboratory parameters. So they are doing very well in terms of uh, acute phase reactant, uh, rash, arthralgia, and so on. What is quite interesting, even from the control of ocular manifestation, there is in some patient an amelioration of optic nerve thickness. What is in problem, what is the problem is uh, that uh, despite the treatment and despite the complete control of the, uh, the, the, the acute phase reactants, there are some patients that still progress towards hearing loss. That is a possibility, and this is a main issue, uh, one, one, uh, one unsolved problem in this condition, because there are some patients that can improve the hearing loss, but some of the patients can progress towards hearing loss despite the proper treatment and complete control. So, uh, of course, uh, this is also related to the fact that if we make a needle uh, aspiration of uh, uh, the uh, cerebral liquid um, we can find some parameters of inflammation. So the good practice is, in, especially in very severe SINCA patients, is sometimes to make, of course, a magnetic resonance and sometimes also to check there is a control, complete control of CNS inflammation in this patient, because otherwise you have to, to increase the dose of the drug, even if the patient has a complete control of acute phase reactor. Uh, and there are some experience on, for example, some years ago at the, in the care in Paris, in which it was clear that in some very severe and bad uh, CAPS patient, SINCA patient, you have to increase the dose a lot to have a complete control. Uh, you can, of course, control the grow, the overweight, but um, sometimes you have to reach three dosage of seven, and some, some patients we arrive also to something like 10 milligram per kilo, considering that the starting dose is one, two milligram per kilo. So you have to increase in the, the very severe patient a lot, the dose to control the overactivation of IL-1. Uh, indeed, this disease, this uh, treatment is uh, with anakinra is rather safe. Uh, this is the experience in the NIH cohort that show that uh, the number of the adverse events are not that high and the most importantly, uh, prevalently, they are mild or moderate. Of, uh, you can see here, uh, very, very few patients have a severe uh, 
uh, adverse event. So this uh, treatment seems to be very safe. This is the same also, I have to say, for, uh, for canakinumab. Uh, you can have some, some uh, injection site reaction, but that in this condition is, met, is less frequent uh, rather than in other condition. They usually do not have, they can have at the beginning of the treatment, but you can see here afterwards, they tend to, to handle very well with uh, the site reaction with anakinumab. What to do in very young, young children? This is a tricky condition. Of course, if you have the possibility to have an akinra, you have to start very, very quickly. I have to, to show you the, the experience of Anna, you can see, was very bad, very severe, a, a classical Sinca phenotype with the, the uh, bossing of the head. You can see the neurological involvement. I was very worried because uh, uh, she was the dizygotic twin that I showed you before. Uh, and uh, uh, the disease also was very early, daily urticaria rash with a low-grade fever, uh, acute elevation, acute phase reactant. We make the, the clinical diagnosis at the age of five, five months, he had this stunted grow, but we start an akinda immediately, that was very important, of course, even before the, the, the result of genetic test. Uh, she had this important neurological involvement, and of course, before the advent of a, a, a early diagnosis and early treatment, for sure, Anna should have a lot of neurological impairment. That was not the case because we were able to increase the dose. She had a very good control of acute phase reactant, but unfortunately, with slight elevation acute phase reactant, we have to increase the dose, even giving the dose splitting in two, um, we arrived to seven milligram per kilo splitting every 12, uh, 12 hours and <coughs> uh, splitting in two doses to control. I have to say that uh, fortunately Anna had a, a very com a complete normal neurological development. She's intelligent. She go to school at the same intelligent of the, the twin sister. Uh, unfortunately, she progressed toward hearing loss, I have to say, but uh, she, she is normal and she is Anna. Uh, before, be, be, this is the, the card from uh, the family some years ago, uh, just to show the good story of Anna with her sister. Uh, the kanakinumab also, you have to increase the dose. There is this study some years ago, a trial that showed that patient, uh, pediatric patient, with, especially with the NOMID, need to have a higher doses rather than a, a patient with macular wells that can have 150 milligram every eight weeks. Uh, that is not the case for the, 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 the pediatric patient that have to increase a lot of the dose. In a very small study, but in daily life, you, we are able to observe one year of treatment in cath patient. And we understood that uh, if the patient with macular wells can stay very well with 100 milligram uh, or two milligram per kilo every eight weeks, uh, the patient with Sinca have to increase a lot the dose. You can see here, every arrow is an increasing of the dose to keep uh, the good control. And most of the patient need four milligram per kilo or 300 milligram every four weeks. So again, you have to increase the dose according to the severity of the disease. Uh, uh, okay. So uh, alternative drugs, this is quite interesting because uh, <clears throat> I understand that anakinra is, uh, or anakinra is daily injection. Kanakinumab is very, uh, very, very uh, expensive, uh, very difficult to obtain. It will be important to have other uh, I1 blockers or, or, or drug that uh, can be used. Uh, there are some small molecules that are uh, under uh, development and even uh, some in which there are some clinical trials ongoing. Uh, uh, for example, this one that is an uh, inhibitor of neuroinflammasome, the other uh, old 177. We also we were included in this paper and we provide evidence that uh, these inhibitors were able to reduce the I1 secretion in our uh, patient uh, in vitro. Uh, we also provide uh, in our lab a mouse model of. Uh, uh, Crioperiopathy. That is a very interesting mouse model in which the patient, the, the mice, as you understand uh, here, uh, grow much, uh, have a much less survival here 
But what is interesting, because there are several mouse models that, that usually uh, die very early in the first week of the disease. This model is much, much milder. You can see here, they can have several weeks of life and that they allow them to develop a chronic disease, very similar to the human disease, in which they also can develop systemic uh, the, uh, the amyloidosis deposition. And we were able to uh, uh, make a, a study on uh, the, the, the use of esomeprazole. Uh, high dose of methadone was able to reduce a lot the survival, to uh, increase the survival of the mice treated and reduce the secretion of uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine and prevent the deposition of an amyloid. Uh, we think that uh, the proton pump inhibitors uh, are inhibiting this uh, important pathway for the calcium efflux that is important for the activation of the second signals. As you can see here from uh, this uh, cartoon, uh, there are many different strategies to block uh, the I1 over secretion, not only anti I1 or I1 receptor antagonists, but also antioxidant because reactive acid, uh, 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 reactive oxygen species that's very important for the activation of the inflammasome some inhibitors. And uh, uh, recently there is also an important paper uh, using some uh, um, drugs that are, uh, let's say, controlling the uh, uh, formation of the, the, the pore of gas dermine that is very important for the piroptosis. Uh, this group uh, was able to identify a, 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 a drug uh, that is used usually for the alcoholic uh, 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 um, uh, for the people that is addicted to alcohol, uh, that is Dusilfidran, that is very able to prevent the formation of the pore of the gastermin formation, pore formation, and uh, has been also observed to reduce significantly mortality in uh, I1 mediated mortality in model of sepsis. Um, so there is still a lot of things to do in CAPS is a fascinating disease that in a way was a prototype of an auto-inflammatory disease. You know very well that the, uh, knowing the me mechanism of activation of the inflammasome, uh, we, we understood a lot of uh, uh, mechanisms related to inflammation in different uh, uh, multifactorial and very, uh, very frequent uh, uh, diseases uh, like gout, uh, even uh, like in, uh, in uh, different uh, vascular manifestation in uh, in a, a heart attack and also even in, in tumors. And this is, uh, was related to the study of this uh, system. There is still a lot of things to do uh, for the patient. This is the person, the people leading, uh, working with me in uh, the Gaslini Hospital, all the Center for Auto-Inflammatory Diseases and the Immunodeficiency <clears throat> with the people in the lab and the clinicians, the Eurofever, project uh, with the staff of Printo, Nicola Ruperto, and all the people uh, uh, included, the patient in the Eurofiber project, that is more than uh, uh, 4,000 patients with different diseases. I invite you to, to contact me if you want to be part of this huge international project that we have patients from India, and we would love to collaborate, of course. Um, uh, I finished with this presentation of uh, the, 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 the Congress of our society, International Society of Auto-Inflammatory Disease. I have the honor to be president. And uh, next uh, year, we will not have, unfortunately, the, the meeting uh, in person, but it will be the possible to follow a, a interesting new way to, to have a meeting. It will be not in two or three days, like for other meetings. Uh, ACR, uh, EULA, uh, Press, and EULA, and so on, uh, we decide to have a periodic congress. Of course, dealing with a, a periodic fever, uh, we didn't uh, have any choice other than make a periodic congress. That means that we will have a congress that will uh, last for six months. Every month, we will have two sessions, so everyone can uh, connect it and follow the section, not in three days, but during the year. I hope that uh, it will uh, help you to, to enter again in contact with the world, the fascinating world of auto-inflammatory disease that you can, can facilitate you to participate in the community of International Society of Auto-Inflammatory Disease. 
that is very active and work very well. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Of course, I'm very happy to take your question whenever you want. Sir, there are a few questions in the chat box. One is regarding NOM, NOMID. Uh, do these children always present at birth? And if not, how long can present? Uh, how long can the presentation can be delayed? So uh, thank you for the question. Of course, <clears throat> the, the more severe NOMID patient really started <coughs> in the first uh, uh, day of life. So uh, if you have a patient with this client, typical urticaria rash with elevation acute phase reaction, uh, of course you have to think among the different differential diagnoses immediately to this condition. Uh, it's very hard to find patients that do not present urticaria rash. Uh, I have a patient that have just very few skin manifestations and start we have more the neurological manifestation, the bossing, and the persistent inflammation with very few skin rash. Uh, that, and that was mainly for the, the appearance and the persistent inflammation, I suspected an mm -hmm. LRP tray mutated disease. And I, and I was able to make the diagnosis when he was three years old. But however, usually a severe SINCA patient starts very early. Sometimes, you, you can have a very early also patient like the case of Nicolò uh, with a Michael West, less severe. So, of course, you have to wait. Unfortunately, the neurological involvement, as you have seen with Anna, is very early, also in Sinca. So, if you have a combination of urticaria rash and a neurological involvement, you've, you make the magnetic resonance and you find the meningitis or you make the puncture, and you find a sign of inflammation in the uh, um, central liquid uh, fluid, uh, you have to suspect that this rash is pertinent to a very severe condition, SINCA. If you do not have neurological involvement and everything is just skin rash and uh, urticaria rash, even if the, the child is so young, you have to think maybe this could be a less severe disease, a macular wells disease. I hope I, I reply to your 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 question. So thank you, sir. Another question: How significant is somatic mosaicism in NLRP3 in clinical practice? Yes, it's very significant, especially in patients with synchanomid. Uh, I think that uh, it's very important uh, <clears throat> to screen uh, uh, for a gene. Or oh, now nowadays with the new technique. Uh, Usually, making the panel according to the how deep can go the panel in the identification, the search of the single gene, uh, they can find out directly the so the the, the mosa mosaicism even in the first screening. But in the past, uh, when there was the classical Sanger se uh, sequencing, uh, I, I think that most of the patients uh, were missed in terms of the. The, the, especially those that have very, very low frequency of this variant, and just with special uh, uh, technology, we were able to identify. Uh, so, however, is rather important because uh, in the, the first uh, uh, year of observation of this syndrome, after the identification, we understood that uh, almost 30% of the patients were with somatic mosaicism, with chinka phenotype. That is a lot. So is it? rather relevant. Thank you, sir. Is SAA specific for auto-inflammatory syndromes? That's another question from Shankar, sir. Sorry, I didn't get your question. Is SAA specific for auto-inflammatory syndromes? Ah, seromyeloid A. Yes. Uh, uh, no, is not specific at all. Uh, it, uh, it's like CRP, as you know. <clears throat> However, you know very well that uh, it's very important to, to mainly follow the patient um, because uh, he's uh, much more able to identify a, a subclinical inflammation, uh, more sensitive rather than normal CRP. Of course, maybe high sensitivity, high sensitivity CRP is also 
variable, very sensitive, but uh, uh, zero metal day is rather uh, easy to, to, to do. And not all the lab have it, but if the lab can do, it's not that difficult and uh, can give you this kind of uh, subliminal uh, inflammation that can help you a lot, especially in tuning the treatment in autoinflammatory disease. Because if you have a normal, con uh, normal clinical therapy, normal clinical manifestation, no more fever, no more rash and so on, but you still have some uh, sign of inflammation, of course, you can increase the dose, try to reduce the subclinical inflammation that in Sinca and even in the macro wells is an important uh, thing to avoid because we can assume if we found some inflammation in the blood, some inflammation can be also in the ear, in the, in the inner ear, and that is the reason why uh, we have to really uh, down-modulate a lot with the treatment. Thank you, sir. Another question, sir. Any role for Igarati mode in IL-1 mediated disorders? Sorry, I didn't get. Any role for Igarati mode in IL-1 mediated disorders? IGU are a Igurati mode. I didn't uh, get the first part of the question. I, I understood the I1 mediated disease, but I, I, sorry, I didn't get the first part. IL1 mediated disorders. Igurati yes. mode in IL1 mediated disorders. Did, Was you... asked by Suma Bailan, madam. Sorry, I, I really don't, don't understand what you are saying. I'm okay. sorry. Okay, sir, sorry. Uh, another last question, sir. Any experience in cochlear uh, implant? Yeah. Um, yes, we have some experience. Um, we had an experience with Anna, I show. Uh, recently, she had a cochlear implant with a very good result. We, we discuss a lot this with the family and also with uh, the, the colleague in NIH, with Rafaela Goldman-Maski. They have, I think, two patients. Uh, there are a few patients in the world that have been trust that make a, a cochlear implant. And so far, I have to say that uh, the outcome for Anna was very, very good. You have to do that uh, in, uh, in the proper way, with the proper timing. Uh, but um, I'm rather satisfied so far of the of the results. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, that's all for questions. Uh, so, Ajit Kumar, sir. Uh, so that Igrati mode uh, that is used in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. That was the question whether it was used in. Ah, okay, I do not have any 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 experience of that. My, my question for you. Do you have anti one blockers? We don't have it. I like it. Okay. So that is very important, of course. Let me mention uh, Dr. Geeta is here. Geeta P. Geeta P. Geeta. Uh, 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 hello, sir. Yeah, Dr. Ajay. Hello. Ah, sir. Uh, we don't Gita, have madam. Geeta. Okay. Uh, so that was a very uh, nice talk, sir. A very informative talk on uh, caps, muckle wells, and uh, no mid. I think most of them are autosomal dominant, isn't it, sir? Yeah, most of them are autosomal dominant. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> as you know, as I told you, uh, in the Sinca uh, phenotype, we have the novel mutation. Sinca, you may have novel. Okay. Yeah, so there is no family history for that. Okay. Because, uh, so that that uh, <coughs> that is the the problem. Sometimes the family history is not uh, is not helpful in the identification. More the clinical phenotype. The problem with this patient, I I think that is very very uh, let's say very very sad uh, because I, I would say that is is uh, I have I'm unfortunately I have to say that is very frustrating. Uh, treating this patient without anti-1 blocker, because the story of this patient before 2005, I have seen a lot of this patient 
that has been uh, uh, born before this date and uh, was uh, really very sad to say that uh, very few drugs were helping them. No immunosuppressant, no other biologic anti-TNF, no, uh, let's say, uh, other, uh, other um, drug. I'm reading here, of course, uh, for, for example, using thalidomide and other drug, uh, I don't know very well the drug before uh, uh, was mentioned. Uh, I try to, to come back, uh, uh, that is uh, 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 Iguratimod, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not aware, but uh, essentially this patient can uh, respond in a way to steroid, but became steroid dependent at a certain point, it's not uh, possible anymore to, to... So I think that uh, the only possibility is to struggle a lot to <clears throat> have uh, a, an, a, an Akindra in India, or if possible, some, some other drug, a, a biosimilar, that can have the same mechanism. Uh, if you have problem in providing the drug, please call me, uh, and maybe there will be some, uh, some, uh, some possibility maybe to, to use some uh, inhibitors of NRP3. So it's really sad to know that in our world there are patients that can be cured with a very, in a very efficient way. Uh, and the only way to cure them, unfortunately, is using I1 blocker. Because you understood the mechanism. Yeah. We have Dr. Uh, C.K. Sasidhan, sir, our forum HOD. Sir, uh, can you give me your uh, opinion? Can you, any, any... I just want to make a comment. That's an excellent talk. A learning mode for me, and we certainly look into <clears throat> clinical problems in the years to come. I will say we have come across these. One, one situation we come across is infantile eczema, atopic dermatitis, which may be uh, for the, the, the auto inflammatory syndrome, which I just, just described. Most of them coming with. Uh, this type of articarial rash, fever, they're treated with antibiotics and you know some emollients in the skin, they get better, but some do come back. So this is a, a very nice session for me. When such patient comes, we will certainly look into this uh, auto-inflammatory syndromes in some of them. I think we'll, we'll we probably be missing them for long. Thank you, uh, Professor Marco, for an excellent. Was my great pleasure. Is uh, the real aim of uh, of the topic to to discuss and to make aware the uh, the colleague of this rare, ultra rare disease. But however, indeed, when you see a patient with a strange urticaria rash, with fever, yes. inflammation, that do not yes. respond, not itching, you do not That's respond right. to antihistaminics, you have to think about. Thank you. Thank we you. have uh, Dr. Vinod's career from uh, PSR IJ. Vinod, uh, any comments, uh, any questions, Vinod? Uh, no, I don't have any questions, uh, but uh, thank you, Dr. Gatona, for the fantastic talk. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me. Dr. Yes. Geeta Govindraj is our uh, professor who is dealing with uh, primary immunodeficiencies as well as auto-inflammatory syndromes in Calicut Medical College. Uh, she was the one, she's a uh, uh, what do you call lead here? And can Gita, can you just give your uh, <coughs> have something to say? Gita, can you unmute? Gita MG, can you unmute? And Un you're muted, uh, madam. Please unmute. Yeah, is it okay now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yes. Professor Gatorno, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, real eye-opener of a talk because uh, auto-inflammatory syndromes are something that we are just starting uh, to diagnose now that uh, uh, we are suspecting these. And uh, actually, the aim of this series is to enable uh, pediatricians to start suspecting and diagnosing these uh, syndromes more often and helping these patients. As uh, has been alluded to before, we do not have any IL-1 blockers in India to use in our patients. 
and so that is one drawback so probably when we have data we would that would possibly enable us to get access uh, to this uh, these wonderful drugs that you are using over there yeah uh, i would like Hello. to call on dr kishore if he's here dr kishore please are you there Open. Madam, not there, madam. Not there. Okay, right. Uh, Dr. Mohandas, Mohandas is president of Indian Academy of Pediatrics, uh, Calicut branch, and he is professor of pediatrics in our department too. Mohandas, hello. Uh, sir, it was a very nice talk, and uh, we have seen few such cases in our institution also, and uh, this series of talks on. Uh, the sort of inflammatory syndromes which we had for the last few weeks will definitely improve our uh, capacity to diagnose and treat such conditions and we are uh, greatly benefited out of this lecture yeah i'm pretty sure because we are very 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 skilled doctors very very able to recognize these conditions so i, I and so I, I hope also and of course i'm more than happy to help you Whenever, whenever you want to 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 your make your diagnosis and then the management of this patient, including including the patient in the registry, more more than happy to help. Of course, be, because this is of course the aim also not only of our institute but also the society that is an international society that, that provide help in uh, for patient wherever they are. So we have to push a lot as a society to give the, the chance to all the patients in the world to receive a proper diagnosis and the treatment. This is our aim and uh, the, 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 what we, our goal, what we have to do. So whatever you think could be useful uh, for you, uh, ask, don't worry. We can be part of some uh, study, the, uh, the project that you are mentioned, no? We can yeah. be part of the project and... Uh... Excellent. Yes. Yeah, we yes. Can, and, uh, I think Dr. Gida would take it up. And uh, we know, Skira, I think it's high time that we should have Anna Kindra in our country. Yeah, of course. Uh, we should actually we should actually tell the government that it needs to be approved in and made available. Yeah, because a lot of conditions, uh, it will be useful. Right. Ajay, Absolutely. any other any anyone to give the comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, any question? Yeah. Hello. Yes, sir. I think. Yeah. Ajit, hello. Hello. Uh, Dr. Suma, yes. yeah. Dr. Suma. Yes, madam. Hi. Uh, hi, Marco. Uh, this is Dr. Suma from Kochi. We have been corresponding with you recently. Hi, Suma. About, uh, yes. uh, you know, the child. Yeah. It is an issue with uh, the IL 1 inhibitors, which is why I brought up this question about igiratumod it's a japanese drug essentially which they have trialed in ra and it's actually quite helpful in those patients but its main mode of action is through the nf kappa b i see uh, and it uh, it actually seems to be working on the inflammasome okay so it was just a it was a query really if anyone has done any work from repurposing this drug yeah. in this format, you know? That was I, the question. No, I, think we, I mean, we've tried, uh, we have a few patients with uh, both, uh, you know, j j mutation proven caps as well as suspected. And uh, uh, there are the milder ones are, are actually doing pretty well with thalidomide or lenalidomide. Uh, with, with no lasting issues at all yeah. but uh, there are those who have you know more severe problems and it's very sad when we're not able to get them anakindra i mean i have actually written to the government with no avail so far unfortunately but um, the thing is uh, this is, we are desperately on the hunt for other possibilities we've tried jack inhibitors as well uh, out of desperation, and they haven't helped. Baricitinib hasn't helped. Mm. Um, uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's so important what you say because <clears throat> I I think that the drug repro uh, uh, the, the, the drug the, the, 
the, the possibility to, to analyze other drug could be uh, very interesting, like the, 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 the example that I show you for the sulfiram, uh, that I don't think is a very expensive drug, uh, but uh, if you have the possibility to prove that uh, a given drug is able to, in a way, compete, in this case is the formation of the pore of gas vermin for the pyroptosis. Of course, it would I mean, be very... I have... Yeah. And uh, what we can do, if you have suspicion of a drug that is not expensive, what we can provide using our tool, even using our mice model, to this drug, the drug that you, 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 you think can be useful, have some impact, for example, in modulating the secretion of I1 by the monocytes, like I show you for the NLRP3 inhibitors. Yeah. And, and also it can provide some help in the mice model. So I think that uh, uh, we can help you also. Uh, okay. I have to say that uh, we, we, we provide in, the, in the some, uh, some grants uh, with our friends uh, that have uh, this kind of technicalities from drug uh, repository. Uh, but uh, so far, we were not, not able to, to, to have funding for that. That is a pity, maybe because uh, the funding agency know that uh, we have until one, very expensive, <laughs> and they don't want yes. to make any effort on drugs. But for this issue, especially for, for your countries, would be very important to have other, uh, other possibilities. Because on your advice, you know, I'm giving IL-1 right now to a child from Maldives whose government supply, you know, supports her uh, therapy and marvelous. Yeah. The effect is marvelous, but it's very sad when we don't have yeah. to offer to yeah. our own patients. I don't understand that is more, uh, because for example, do you have anti-I6? Yes, we have so anti-IL-6, both for intravenous of, of and cost. subcutaneous. Yeah. It's not a question, a matter of cost, because anti-IL-1 is absolutely the same cost of anti-6 treatment. So it's the problem, the problem is, is uh, the lack is the, of, uh, you know, they, they don't see a market for anti-L1. Yes, that is the problem that I struggle a lot with the company, because it's more a problem of the company. Mm -hmm. And that is silly, because if, if you think to one billion person and, and the, the, the possibility to, to, to have a much more patients with caps than in Italy, of course, in India. So it's something that we have to struggle a lot with the company. Thank you. My pleasure. I, I, if I, 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 of course, I'm more than happy to try to help <laughs> as a society, as an expert and so on, because it's uh, so important. We do, uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so I'll continue, continue. No, no, no. I was just asking one more thing because each uh, prefill syringe comes up as 100 milligram. Uh, what, have you had any experiences with splitting the syringe over a couple of days? Because that's what we do for when a few times we've got it in an, you know, a severe HLH or that kind of scenario. We've done that. We so split splitting, the dose over a couple of days. So splitting a dose yeah. one day and then the other day. Yeah, yeah. You can do because uh, if you say uh, there is no, I mean, no proof that uh, after 24 hours the drug in the fridge is still have still the same, uh, let's say, yeah. um, let's say, uh, function. Uh, otherwise, I understand that if you do not have any other possibility, uh, you you can try, but uh, theoretically you should not. Okay. From the the, yeah. the point of view, regulatory point of view, of course. Yes. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Suma and uh, Dr. Ajay for the word of thanks. Uh, uh, hello, sir. Can you hear now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, firstly, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Marco for the excellent discussion Sarah has done. On systemic auto uh, uh, systemic auto inflammatory, and uh, uh, Dr. Ajit Kumar sir for coordinating the session. And finally, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Vinod and Dr. Gida, who has been be behind this uh, pediatric immunology seminars. 
for the last one month there's been a uh, like it, it has been a uh, it's a web, webinar of informations so and this is the first time i think we are having this type of immunology series in the whole of india thank you madam and uh, thank you dr vinod kumar sir and also also dr mohan mohan das sir our iap president uh, for coordinating the sessions thank you sir and uh, also all the participants dr suma madam dr ck shashi sir and dr sabik who 